Welcome again to Cottage Talk. I am Russ Goldman. Joining me right now is Dan Crawford from Hamian.com and the Green Pole Podcast. Please check out Dan's latest episode of the Green Pole Podcast with Oscar Bloom, where they talk about what we're about to talk about, and that's the contracts of Harrison Reed and Jal Polina. We're going to be talking about that in this episode. I look forward to it. As always, please do subscribe on YouTube and Apple Podcasts to Cottage Talk. We really appreciate it. Dan, let's not waste any time. Let's get to it. I want to get your initial reaction to this news. I was very surprised. What was going through your head when you saw the news that Paulina and Harrison Reed signed new contracts? I was frantically trying to find a calendar to check. We ha- I hadn't fast-forwarded to April 1st, Russ, if I'm honest with you. Um, Harrison Reed is excellent. You know, we'd been hoping that that would happen, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, he was looking from for some assurances from the football club about his own playing time and his his value to the club. So you know we kind of hope that uh, and Marco Silva did allude to trying to get that contract done um, during the transfer window at the tail end of the transfer window because he'd been the subject of some fairly um, scandalous offers, shall we say, or bids yeah. from. From, from other teams who aren't worth discussing uh, at this point. I uh, will come to that maybe later. Jao Polina, on the other hand, I mean, that one, I didn't see that one coming through the Harlem Tunnel or any other American tunnels that you can educate <laughs> me on. Um, what's, the, what's the nearest tunnel to you in New England? Come on. There must be a Patriots tunnel, is sure, there? Sure, no, th- there's uh, the Ted Williams Tunnel. Okay. Uh, the, even the Ted Williams Tunnel did not, Prepare me for <laughs> Joao Palina signing a long contract and seemingly, I know we'll get into this, no release clause. Um, you know, and there's plenty of cynicism where that deal is concerned, that it's solely to give him a payday. It may be an Edwin van der Sar type contract to ensure that Fulham get full value. Right. Um, but I think actually it signifies something else and perhaps we'll get to that but you know how about the only way this could have been better is if they had announced a treble contract extension with Marco involving Marco Silva but you know let's not be greedy let's celebrate the fact that our two main central midfielders have committed to Fulham Football Club and we know what contracts are worth they're not really worth that much but it's better to have them on long-term contracts than not Absolutely, Dan. And I actually watched the interviews of both players. I'll talk about that while we do the show. But my thoughts on this, again, I was just shocked. I was driving home from work, and I got an alert from Fulham Football Club that they had made these signings. And I actually thought it was a joke. I didn't believe it. It came right on my screen. I was like, this can't be real. But it is real. And Some pretty good I... AI in those photos if it's not real, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, they're getting good at that. but. Not that good, Dan. Not that good. But what's interesting about this, like I said, my first thought was, I cannot believe it's happened. I I texted you WTF. Like, I just couldn't believe it. But, and then after everything subsided and I thought about it, I was trying to think about what is the motivation behind doing this by the player and also by the club. So let's start with Paulinha. I think it's pretty obvious what the motivation here is, Dan. I think it's about a payday. It's about money, right? So what do you think his ultimate motivation is here? Is it about just getting more money? Is it about, could there possibly be something, a gentleman's agreement down the road that, Hey, listen, you sign this deal. We'll let you talk to other clubs and we might let, might sell you if we find a replacement down the road. Why do you think he decided to do this? Well, I think I hesitate to say it's not about money. Because there's clearly, clearly Fulham have probably doubled his wages. I would think so. I would think so, maybe more. I don't know. I don't know how much Jao Polina was on previously. But I'd imagine he'd be in the sort of Jean-Michel Serri, Andre Frank Anguissa, Burnt Leno type numbers, which would put him around 65, 70 grand a week on the, on the previous contract. Because... That would probably be double what he was on at Sporting Lisbon. 
Right. I'm sporting Club de Portugal. I always get in trouble for calling them sporting. Uh, sporting, we can call them. The, the, sure. There are uh, many of my friends are Portuguese and, and some of them support sporting. And I always get in trouble for anglicizing their name. <laughs> Not that they'll be listening to this. They may well, actually. So I don't want to impinge your, your, your viewers um, too much or offend anybody. Um, yeah. So... I imagine that he's probably now in the Mitrovic bracket, if I can use that comparison in terms right. of money. And while it's not Saudi Arabian style money, this is a player who's now 28 and uh, and by the summer will be 29. And the length of the contract takes him to sort of Tim Ream range. Now, I'm not foolish enough to think... You know, I was foolish enough to think we might hold on to Mitrovic to the end of his contract. Um, obviously, we know that was fallacy, really. Um, but so, so there is a financial imperative. I think that does recognise that he's a better player. He's proven himself right as, an, as a significant player. You know, not not just in Fulham circles, but around the world. Um, I think there's a. There, there's obviously an imperative for Fulham to try and recognise that he's an important player because Bayern Munich definitely nearly got him on the very cheap, as far as I'm concerned. I and agree. They, they clearly don't want that to happen again. So I imagine, and there's a fair bit of educated guesswork or uneducated guesswork in my case. I'll leave your, your viewers and listeners to decide. But if we take at face value the idea that the fee for Paulina in September was early September was 60 to 65 million pounds which seems about roughly where the reporting was I imagine that this contract on its own would take that fee that would be required to um, acquire Paulina in January or beyond to around 80 I would say you know I don't I know agree with that. this right. is guesswork right. right so there's an element of protecting your asset but it's also saying to people who are um, looking at signing for Fulham or appraising Fulham's position in the pantheon of English clubs that we've had, we, we, we don't want another Mitrovic scenario to happen, for instance. Right. And if you need to, I always use the Joe Maguire uh, phrase on your program, so I won't <laughs> do it again. Show but me the money. To pay top dollar yeah. to acquire Jao Polina. That's important. What's his motivation? Yeah. Well, he wants to play at the highest level possible, for sure. And maybe this is also about saying, well, we believe we can get higher than 10th in the table. You've been quite clear about this, Russ, and I've mocked you for saying that Fulham are going to finish 7th this season. Yeah. Well, I think you were high on your own supply when you <laughs> when, when you forecast that. Deep in the depths of Mitrovic, William, Silva, and then even Polina. Are you still... I reckon you you're not relent. There's no. Surrender. I am not. There's no. There's no surrender. I'm still. No. I'm sticking with seventh. I'm not surrendering. I apologise to to students of the troubles for using that phrase. It's very inappropriate. <coughs> Russ is not for turning, shall we say? Right. Um, but there's an element of this about Fulham standing as well. It's a very good deal that Fulham have done. It saves oh. a bit of face, I think, because. You've been quite clear as well about questioning the long-term ambition. And and Marco has done that. And it was interesting to see, we'll get on to Harrison Reed, but yeah. Harrison Reed's comments directly reference the club's ambition as, po as opposed to his own. It's so I think point. there are all those things to factor in. But I don't know. I'm not Jao Polina. I'm not right. Tony Khan, clearly. Um, there's a lot of things to, to throw into the melting pot, but there are a few of them. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you did a very good job talking about, again, we're just throwing it out there, thinking about what Paulina's motivation could be, obviously, probably is being paid very well. And I don't know if there was basically, like I said, an agreement here. Like I said, Dan, I'll ask you this before we talk about Fulham and the motivation behind Fulham to do this, but do you think that this changes everything for January? Does this protect them more in January 
does it make it more likely that something could happen in the summertime or am I just being hopeful here because of this deal? Well, I think Fulham would look exceptionally stupid and so would Polina if they go to all this trouble and then he's off in January. I mean, I mean, famous last words and all of that, but sure, he, he's reiterated his commitment and also... I don't know if you do Instagram. I don't really. I have. An I just saw the Instagram post. Yeah, it's quite fulsome from Polina on his preferred method of communication. I haven't seen anything from Polina's brother, his agent, or Polina's wife, or that super fan of João Polina. Some of those Instagram comments from September. We'll gloss over those because they were clearly in the heat at the moment. And who hasn't? posted a naughty social a, a passionate social media message after our team has lost or you know um when we've been jilted or, or whatever it is you know that that's a very human emotion um but i think it does change the picture for january i think it makes it uh, the percentage of keeping Joao Polina for january is probably higher because you're asking you know people will have to buy him out of a little of a longer contract Right. And Fulham will be able to demand a higher fee. I think, to a degree, what this is about for Fulham, and I know I'm preempting the next question, sure, um, sure. is um, Zhao's in, so important for us. You know, every time he's not been in the team, we've not just been beaten, we've been absolutely battered. And no, no more was that apparent than at Manchester City when he wasn't there for very understandable reasons. Um, again, we won't get into that, but we played a very good first half. We should not have been behind at half time. I'm still not over it. Um, and because we had to chase the game in the second half without Polina, without Tom Kearney, you know, gaps opened up. And the best team in Europe, or the, but certainly the best team in England at the moment, but one of the leading teams in Europe, if not the world, exploited the fact that we didn't have a natural holding midfielder. And Joao Polina is clearly, I would say, in the top 10 players in his position in the world. You know, um, I, I think that's unarguable. It might be ambitious and, and biased in our view, but right. you, have to pro you have to value your assets highly or Saudi Arabians will come and steal them. I totally agree, Dan. And again, this is leading us to talk about Fulham's motivation. And what's interesting about this, because I'm going to now throw this into the conversation, because I think what this does is it makes it harder for teams to come in for him in January. I think it's more of a motivation to maybe get something done over the summer if he wants to leave at that point, but it really protects Fulham. I think it comes back to that, Dan. It's a protection, but I'm going to bring this to the table now. What do you make of there not being a release clause? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Oh, I mean, if it's true, and I don't think Fulham will comment officially. Okay. Or, Sky or, Sports or, is reporting this, that there's no release clause. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I take all of these reports with a hefty <laughs> gallop, of, gallop of salt because there may not be a release clause. But I imagine, you know, agents, as we know, are very good at getting things out to suitors of players. Suitors of players, I imagine Bayern Munich, or any or Manchester United, or Liverpool, or Barcelona, or Real Madrid, or whoever it is, they will be told what the money is by Polinia's agent if they are seriously interested. The thing that changes the dynamic on this but it's good that there's no seemingly no release clause as reported not just by sky sports news but also by sky in germany right um also by some other um uh respectable reporters and it's early you know we'll see what the english press if they dare to if this makes any column inches in the english press because when we set I, i'm interested in fabrizio's tweeting tonight and Florian Plettergold, or whatever his bloody name is, the German geezer. <laughs> um, yeah, all of them. Uh, they're all singing from the same hymn sheet, just not as uh, fervently as when they were trying to sell our players. Sure. Um, now, it's good news that there's no release clause. It, it has to be. But I do think there may be a, an understanding that if a Champions League 
club comes in for Zhao, this is the amount of money. Right, that's what I think, Dan. I don't think we're going to do it to him twice. I don't think we're going to fly him out again to a club and say, oh, by the way, we weren't able to source a replacement for you, Zhao. Come back, please, and play in this game immediately. I think that's unlikely to happen a second time. Um, But it's good news. It's good business. And as I said to you at the beginning, it's good PR from a football club that hasn't been great at winning the PR war lately. No, they've been terrible at it, if I'm being honest with you. So this is a good PR moment if you're interested in that. But I also think it's good for the fans. It's it's good all around that this deal has happened, Dan. It's good for Polina. It's good for Fulham. Everyone wins on this. But I what agree with you. Forgive me. Sorry for interrupting you. Go ahead, what Dan. What it does do is it, it, it solidifies Polina's state of mind going into a crucial part of the season. That's a great point. My, my issue was always going to be, there was a situation, and I hate to, to, to use his name because he was a dedicated servant to Fulham Football Club and he definitely deserved his move to Liverpool in 2003, two, three. Steve Finnan went yep. from Fulham to Liverpool and it was widely known that he was going to go to Liverpool and he always gave his best. And I don't want to say he didn't give his best in the last three months or four months, but it was widely thought, widely rumoured that the deal to take Steve Finham for a certain amount of money to Liverpool was done in January and finalised and announced in in the summer. And there was a certain drop-off in his performances. Now, that might have been because other people were injured, we weren't able to pick the same team, but There was a lot of chatter over the media that, you know, clearly the deal had been done in January by Munich New, and maybe he wouldn't charge into the tackles. Maybe he'd take a yellow card. Suddenly he might be injured. Suddenly he might not want to play. And that's going to, you know, he he is going to be right on the money for Luton on Saturday, and so is his mate next to him. And that is absolutely vital because without the two of them, being fully on it and fully committed, we are not, you know, relegation becomes a distinct possibility. If people are just sort of honouring their contract by walking around in the middle of the field, then you've got a problem. Right. I agree, Dan. And I think this actually changes all that. I'm glad that you brought that up because if you watch the interviews of both players, you could tell, you get a feeling that things have changed with Paulina. I have a feeling he will be committed to Fulham for as long as he's with Fulham. Harrison Reed, we're going to talk about next. I think this is even better for him, and we'll go into it based on what I watch from him. I think he's very excited about his new deal, and I think you're going to have an even more motivated Harrison Reed. But what was good about watching the Paulinho video, Dan, before we go to a quick break and then talk about Harrison Reed, is what Paulinho said about Harrison Reed. And you could just tell how he knows how important he is to Fulham Football Club, that relationship. So let's talk a little bit about that because with everything going on, these two signed together and they are now linked together. And Paulina made it perfectly clear how important Harrison Reed is to Fulham Football Club. We'll talk about that after the break, but I want to get your thoughts first. Yeah, I mean... Harrison Reed is vital to, to the club, but also the dynamic that they have between each other and how they've sort of dovetailed. Because remember, they haven't played together for all that long. You know, it was a relationship that was moulded at the start of last season. And it inc- and, and to my mind, I'm still not sold on Harrison Reed as this swashbuckling, you know, because I've said this to you before, box-to-box yep. midfielder. I think Harrison Reed is still a really good, deeper-lying defensive midfielder. But you can't have two of them. Um, and so getting that balance right to so that when Polina is in front of the back four, Reedy goes on and plays in a high, at a higher point, they can swap. You know, yep. Polina has found himself, he's scored a lot of important goals That's for right. them, including... Um, I, I'm really pleased, by the way, that that goal at the Emirates against Arsenal, that wonderful uh, finish is not his last contribution in a Fulham shirt. You know, just from a sort of um, purely aesthetic and, and sentimental 
thing the idea that he could score a couple more goals and uh, uh, you know it's lovely um because he was there's a, been a lot of discussion about how sincere that tapping of the badge is yep. of course uh people will point out that he did score a penalty against the tottenham in the in the league cup and i'm in no way denigrating that but it did seem strange that he went straight from that to angling for this move i know it's amazing the dynamic between the two of them though is really important yes um and they are in their own both in their own individual ways really important but you'll know if you've ever played uh football the central midfield is arguably I, i think the hardest position to play because you've got to be there if you're not there in front of your back four um there's a problem if you're not offering at the other end of the field there's also a problem right and you're expected to be as proficient at it in the 90 well the 125th minute these days as you are in the first minute it's really demanding and so only central midfielders can recognize the importance of another central midfielder and Jao Polinia knows that he's not the quickest across the ground he's a different type of midfielder to Harrison he's more proficient in the tackle but he doesn't have the pace um and Reed is therefore very important he's the sort of Duracell bunny of our midfield if I may uh and it's really important that we've got them both uh because when you miss either even when you miss Harrison Reed, you know he's not there. And we don't have, at the moment, the depth in central midfield. You've got Sasha Lukic, who I really yep. like, and I think he's a really good player. But at the moment, we're asking Sasha Lukic, Tom Kenny, and Luke Harris to fill all sorts of roles that aren't I them. I know. It's interesting because we could talk a little bit about this. I'm glad that you brought up Lukic because I was thinking about him while you were talking, Dan, but I also want to talk a little bit about Luke Harris because Luke Harris, the reports were he was not going to be at Fulham. He was going to be at Exeter and something didn't happen. They could not bring in a player, which is interesting. So now you're adding him to the mix where what is his best role? What is Sasa Lukic's best role? And of course you said Tom Kearney. So there's still a lack of depth there, Dan, even with all the players we're talking about. Yeah, because the game is so varied now the you, you're looking for great coverage. I think you'd use that in a in an American football sense. You're looking for depth and coverage in different positions. Um, and what we've had to do, as Tom Kenny is, you won't like thank me for saying this, as Tom Kenny has got a bit older and, um, and we have to manage his knee injuries, he's sort of become more of a, central midfielder rather than an, than the number 10 that he was in the championship the the yeah. creative player he just i don't think he quite has the the uh the legs that he did five years ago neither do i by the way but in very different <laughs> ways um so you've had to kind of revise what tom Kenny's role is uh lukic i still think lukic's best position is as a number 10 but he's not really played there. He's done really well there for Serbia, but he's right. certainly more of a box-to-box midfielder, I think, than a sitting midfielder. So I think he will benefit from having more of Reed and Pelina at the club because he'll play in a different role. Harris is an interesting one. He was very close to going to Exeter. I think that would have been a, as good a move for, for Luke as it was for Jay Stansfield. Right. Um, and probably as good a move for Luke as Jay's subsequent loan to Birmingham City um it doesn't it didn't work because principally they couldn't move on Polinia and they couldn't find a replacement for Polinia so you weren't going to let someone who could play uh, I think Luke will dovetail between the under 21s and, and the first team he certainly oh, didn't look out of his depth at Manchester no, City he could have scored yeah um, I was hoping he would have done with just a little little better of a shot it would have been a goal and that would have been lovely you know Luke Harris has the potential to be one of the best footballers Fulham have ever produced. And I don't, I, say agree. That, I don't say that lightly, but, you know, I don't go back as far as Johnny Haynes in terms of watching him <laughs> watching him play. But but he does have all of the attributes. He just has to train on in a way that we hoped. I don't know, Karim Fry, um, Patrick Roberts. You know, there is a long list. of There is a, a of huge people. list. Emerson, but Hyman. Luke, we can yeah, well, yeah, MO indeed. Um, 
Yeah. You know, what what a thank you, Jurgen Klinsmann, for for messing with uh, Emo's head at that oh, particular oh. time. Let's not disappear down that particular rabbit hole. No, but definitely. I think because we don't have the depth that we were discussing, holding on to your key players is important. Yeah, of course. But the benefit of not signing adequate cover until you go in go in in January is that there's an opportunity. For Luke Harris, and I would say the draw against Norwich City, you might try Luke Harris in the number ten role. I would. City. I'd like to see that. Yeah, I'd I like agree with see, you. There. I'd like to see Ollie O'Neill. I'd like to see a couple of these other young players who are doing doing really well get an opportunity. Um, and the further we go in the League Cup, because I'd like to beat Norwich City and get a bit further in the competition. Hell, I'd like to win it, Russ. Why um, not? You know. It's an opportunity for some fringe players to to make their their way, and that's also tuned into the ambition that Marco speaks about. You know, why can't we win some trophies? Dan, I'm there with you. I say let's go for the League Cup. I'm glad that you brought us there. But coming up next, Dan and I are going to finish up by talking about the deal for Harrison Reed. Okay, Dan, let's finish this up. Let's talk about the motivation. For actually, let's start with Harrison Reed. Obviously, you have to imagine he got a significant pay increase here, but I also think it's good for him because I think that based on what I watched, I think he really wanted this. And I think this not only protects Fulham, we'll talk about that in the second half, but I'm very happy for him because I think he deserved to be rewarded, Dan. Why do you think he wanted this so badly? Oh, I mean, first of all, I think he's a criminally underrated footballer. I think in pure monetary terms, he was undervalued um, in, in his existing contract. I, you know, it's widely reported in some outlets that we don't always trust, the Evening Standard and Sky Sports, that he was still on around £30,000 a week, which is a lot of money to you and I. But in, oh, yeah. the, in, in, the, uh, in the world of Premier League football, that's quite a poor average wage these days. You know, and I was having this conversation earlier on today and, and even on our Green Poll uh, podcast that preceded this. I mean, the hours are blurring into one at the moment. But I, I did sort of, and, and you'll be well-placed to answer this, I mean, I think Harrison Reed should have a shot at some sort of international recognition. It's clearly not going to happen at the moment. But I do think you take your full and blinkers off, you... you right. know, scratch around for the other English qualified central midfielders. I'm not coming up with a great deal. Um, and he has improved his game markedly. He's a goal scoring threat now, not as regularly as he or I would like, you know, there's a couple of times he's had a shot and he hasn't really come off, but Marco Silva has made him a better player. So first and foremost, this is recognition of not just that, but all the effort. He's made 150 appearances. For right. Fulham. He's been reliable. He deserves this. But it's also more than just about what he deserves. It's underlining his importance to Fulham. And exactly. he's a Premier League player. He's a, he's a proper, reliable, consistent Premier League performer. And more than that, he's the sort of player that every fan loves. Because you don't have any doubt with Harrison Reed that he's going to give you absolutely everything that he's got when he goes on the pitch. See, right. I agree with all that, Dan. I'm glad that you brought that up because I gravitate to players like Harrison Reed. I'll put Chris Baird in that category. Zoltan Garam, Davis, oh, all these players that will give you 100%. My favorite player, Danny Murphy, it's, it's the same type of player that Harrison Reed is. I could put Bobby Decker over Reed, similar type of player. Mm -hmm. Brian McBride is, is another one. Who Brian McBride. I'm glad you brought up Brian McBride. And these are the type of players that I love, and that's why I'm so happy for him. But when we talk about Fulham's motivation for doing this, now, you and I talked about this at the beginning of the show. I was actually surprised by the interest at the very end of the window. You don't want to mention the team. I'm going to mention the team as being Wolves. And I was shocked by this. And then, again, the reports were that Harrison Reed might be interested. Now, if you saw the interview with Harrison Reed, I would say go watch the interview on FulhamFC.com, FFC TV. It looks like a player that never wanted to leave Fulham Football Club, Dan. It just looked like 
he was hoping that a deal would get done. And I think the interest from Wolves actually gave him the leverage to get a deal done. That's the way I feel because I think he wanted to stay at Fulham and Wolves actually, I think, helped in that situation getting him a new deal. So I think the motivation here for Fulham is to reward a player but also protect them in case someone else like Wolves comes in. Well, I think the, the bit you haven't mentioned is um, the the you know the crazily low three million four million for Harrison Reed you know oh it's, it was horrible I mean I, I would have just put the laughter track on the phone and told them to call back when they're being serious you know get, make sure don't put the work experience boy or girl in charge of your transfer negotiations lads <laughs> you know I know Wolves haven't got as much money as they think they did have and you know look let's be clear about this. I'm not surprised Premier League clubs are interested in Harrison Reed, right? Let, let, let's make that point first of all. He would be a benefit to most teams in the Premier League. But I think Harrison Reed would have had a concern that potentially if Fulham were going to upgrade in his position and with Lukic there and with people coming through like Harris and Kearney and you know Pereira can play deeper and Alex Awobi coming into the picture... Can play he that. some assurances yeah. about how regularly he was going to play. I don't think it's about finances because remember he was at Southampton for a long time, and Southampton gradually improved. And it's interesting we're talking about them now as a, having gone down. Um, and there are many Southampton fans who think that if they'd had a character like Harrison Reed in their dressing room over the last eighteen months, then some of the performances just wouldn't have happened because he would have set the tone and demanded more right. and delivered more. Um, so I think it was largely about his status within the football club and assurances that he was going to play and that Fulham were trying to go places. Because let's be clear, if you know players are not stupid, if you see Mitrovic out the door, if you see Polina agitating for a move, if you can see that your manager isn't, committing to a long-term contract because he's waiting to see what happens players also consider those options right you know they look at is there a more is there a landing spot for me is there a lifeboat out there you know what else is on the table and player power is significant but no fulham's motivation is securing a key player because he's as important to fulham as jao polina is i don't say that lightly wow but it, but i i think so um and that's why, and I'm really pleased they've both done it together. Yeah. Um, it's a huge statement from, from Fulham. Um, I hope it's not the end. And, you know, Kenny Tete needs to uh, get himself in that room and, and we need to make a strong offer to Kenny Tete. And, you know, I hope the photographs have already been taken with Marco. <laughs> so they can, they can announce that tomorrow. That would be very good. That would yeah. be. That would be. I'm still waiting on that, Dan. That's the one that has a huge cloud over the season. Let's say we're talking about that because we're talking about some really good news. This is great news. There's no way you can look at this as not being good news. We could talk about what the ramifications are down the road. But you really nailed so many good things here. you got two players that are now committed. I always believe Harrison Reed was committed to Fulham Football Club. I think this just helps him move forward knowing that they're committed to him. So for me, it's a win-win. The Paulina thing, as you said, Dan, you were worried about the Finnan situation. I think we can now put that aside because I think you're going to get a motivated Paulina. The one thing that I am still worried about is the manager. So I am waiting for that day. I hope it happens, but I, I think we still have to wait and see. I think he's still waiting to see, Dan. Would you agree with me on that? Well, I'd be very surprised if he signed the contract without some assurances because whatever PR is put out there, you can't tell me that a head coach of Marco Silva's calibre was happy with the transfer window. That, he can't that, be. That we just went through. You know, I appreciate that Raul Jimenez has scored some goals for, for Mexico and it'd be nice to talk about it on, an, on another podcast just how good the Fulham international performances were, particularly in your neck of the woods. Yes. Um, 
uh, over the last few days because a lot of people, Bobby Reed scored a penalty. Perhaps he could be a penalty taker. Um, <laughs> now that we now that we've lost a man who was always reliable from twelve yards, you and oh, I yeah. know that, 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 that our former number nine he never missed a penalty for Fulham, did he? Never. Uh, uh, but in all seriousness, you know, we as I've said to you before, Marco Silva has potential to be Fulham's greatest ever manager. He's certainly achieving wonderful things. Um, you know, that has to be priority number one. It should have Absolutely. been right, right at the beginning. He's clearly playing a very smart game because he obviously made eyes at some Saudi Arabians at some point. I, I can't believe that there wasn't some discussion that facilitated them moving so hot, so heavily for a manager of Marco Silva's calibre. The problem is not going to be the Saudi Arabians because he's shown that he values himself higher than that. The problem is going to be other Premier underachieving Premier League clubs, right? Right, because the thing that you know, and I've got no doubt about Marco Silva's professionalism or his commitment to the project because he could have walked much earlier in the process. And I know that West Ham were making overtures towards Marco last season when they were thinking about sacking David Moyes. I mean, not to speak ill of um, West Ham or give them any ideas, but you're not going to convince me that. Moyes to Silver is not a significant upgrade. Um, Tony Gale was one of your previous guests, and I would yep. suggest anyone who hasn't listened to your discussion with Tony Gale or hasn't bought Tony Gale's book does both of those things um, in, in short order this evening. Um, but, uh, yeah, Marco Silva has the ability to take Fulham higher than we've ever been, and you and I both believe that that should be done. And yes. I'm sure Fulham, I'm sure Fulham are working on it, but it may require some investment in January to convince Silver to sign on. And we've not always been the best at recruiting in January. Um, so yeah, look, that that's the next one. We're 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 approaching a key period for Fulham. You know, we need to beat Luton on Saturday. That's a non-negotiable for me. Um, if you're looking at it, be very Fulham is to drop points against Luton. You haven't got any points so far. Um, that'd be exactly what in the history of Fulham Football Club would, 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 would predict. So, you know, but um, Marco's a professional, even if he's only here until June, and I sincerely hope not. He'll manage the team as if he's got another 10 years at his disposal. And I hope we've got another little surprise. You know, they can... I, I'm not... I'm not impatient about that. They can do it next week. <laughs> they can pick a day. They can wait until you're driving home through the Ted Williams Tunnel or wherever it is you drive <laughs> to, not being familiar with the Northeastern geography. They can wait until uh, Max Cohen is at DuPont Circle again, going round and round and round or whatever, <laughs> or he's in some sort of uh, Senate committee hearing, not with his phone, which I gather might have been the case this afternoon. When he heard that news, I don't know. They, they look, they can pick the day. I'm not fussy. Just Neither am I, Dan. Just make it happen. I'm with you, Dan. Just make this happen. This is the other shoe to drop that we just want to drop. Just sign Marco Silva, and I hope it happens. But we're gonna have to wait. He is playing a smart game. I agree with you, Dan. It's just as frustrating because we both know, and I'm glad that you said this. He could be the greatest manager in film history. He has that potential and we want him at foam so i hope that the sides can come together but only time will tell okay then we do have to wrap up this show thank you so much for doing this with me i do want to mention as i mentioned at the beginning of the show please check out dan's show that he did with oscar bloom about this subject matter as well on the green pole podcast read everything on hambian.com he does a great job dan thank you so much for joining me tonight Absolute pleasure. Thank you, Russ. All the best to you and your family and all your all your listeners. All right. Excellent. Well, listen, we will have a preview of the upcoming match against Luton Town on Friday. I'll be dropping that on Friday. And we'll have some post-match shows as well. But it is time to wrap this up for Dan Crawford from Hamian.com and the Green Pole Podcast. I'm Russ Goldman. Thank you as always for watching and listening to Cottage Talk, part of the Talk Sport Fan Network.